Welcome to the podcast. We're podcasting, everybody. This is the Godward Show. I'm your host, Casey. This is Michelle de Montaigne, and we're going to talk about his essays. The episode on Montaigne begins with me dreaming up something like a degree of difficulty scale that I might use at the start of every episode to try to approximate how hard it will be for you to read this book if you, sh- you know, if you should choose to yourself. Because all of my videos are, of course, invitations to read this stuff for yourself. So I might say, you know, for example, reading Thucydides is a pretty rugged 8 out of 10 because it's long and dense and there are a lot of pages about manufacturing ships. Whereas I might say that reading the book of Jonah, for example, is only a 3 out of 10 because it's only three pages long and most of you probably half know the story already and there are only a few surprising details. Probably reading Heidegger is a 9 out of 10 or 9.5 out of 10, but reading Moby Dick is only a 4 out of 10. And note that what I'm saying with that example is that it doesn't necessarily mean the more difficult, the better the book. And I don't think that it should mean more prestige, for example. I think Moby Dick is a higher achievement than anything Heidegger wrote, for example. But it's easier to read. But okay, why do I start this episode talking about this with the Montaigne stuff? Well, it's because, as you'll hear in a minute, this is one of those texts that, even when it's being summarized, sounds like it must be really difficult reading. Montaigne's going to make reference to Cicero and Quintilian, Plato, Aristotle, Democritus, Heraclitus, Livy, and Plutarch, and so on. And so you might be tempted to throw your hands up in the air and just admit defeat, and not think about trying to read Montaigne for yourself. That would be a mistake. Montaigne's difficulty, only a 4 or 5 out of 10, in my opinion. And reading his prose is actually a pleasure. So how does he manage to be such a big brain, but also be sort of easy reading? It's because he makes himself personal. In fact, as he says in his introductory remarks called To the Reader, he says, He says, quote, I myself am the subject of my book. And so what you're really reading when you read his essays is his own takes on various subjects, which means that reading Montaigne gets easier the more Montaigne you read, by the way, precisely because you get to know the guy. Above everything else, he put himself on display. Before I go further, watch this little clip from a video I used to show in class when I taught Montaigne. The speaker is uh, Alain de Botton. I'm sure I'm butchering that name, but that's the guy. Ready? Go. When one hears that Montaigne lived in a castle like this, and that he was the mayor of Bordeaux for two terms, and that he's a philosopher, uh, one might come across uh, certain sort of prejudices. Uh, One might imagine um, the kind of man he was, the kind of things that we'll find uh, in his book. But I think what's remarkable, and for me deeply moving and charming about his work, his most famous work, The Essays, uh, is that actually its contents are nothing like uh, the typical philosophy book um, that Montaigne wanted in this book to, as it were, redraw the whole portrait that we have of what human beings are. Most books didn't seem to Montaigne to really reflect human experience. They edited out all sorts of aspects. What Montaigne wanted to do was to bring these aspects back in, which is why he spends an awful lot of time uh, in his work talking about the kinds of things that most philosophy books leave out. For instance, the penis. Um, He tells us that he wants to talk a lot about his penis. He says, every one of my members, each as much as another, makes me myself, and none makes me more properly a man than that one. I owe to the public my portrait complete. So that's fun, isn't it? I mean, isn't that fun? That makes you want to read this guy. He's personable, he's real, he's, you know, feet on the earth. Okay, so quickly some biography. He was born about 30 years before William Shakespeare in 1533 in France, really right at the high point of the French Renaissance. His family was Catholic, notwithstanding his maternal grandfather, who was a Murano Jew. His family was very wealthy and ensured that Montaigne was educated according to his father's humanist friends. So this is all very Renaissance in nature. This meant learning Latin and Greek and music and so on. After a time in public life, including being elected mayor, he totally retired from public life at the age of 38 and began to write his essays from a stony library in the top of a tower at the top of a spiral staircase in his family's chateau, near Bordeaux, France, I think. 
But before I get to the content of his essays, I do want to say again, this guy is so fun to read, and it would be hard to overstate his influence on literature after his lifetime. Shakespeare read him during his lifetime, and one scholar has suggested that Montaigne had a profound, profound effect or impact on Shakespeare's later plays, and to me this feels plausible, as did you know, other, others who read him include Bacon and Descartes, Pascal, Montesquieu, Burke, Voltaire, Rousseau, Hume, Emerson, Darwin, Nietzsche, Freud, and so on, and I'm leaving a lot of people out. Melville. Of course, it is always a bit of an overstatement to say that the definitive feature of modernism is X, anything. But if someone made me fill in the blank there, I would say that it is the dimension of depth and psychological interiority that makes the modern seem different from everything that preceded it. And yes, I know, like people who love the classics and the ancient stuff will intervene here and say, well, come on, there's certainly a sort of psychological depth in Dante or even in Beowulf or in the Iliad, or if not the Iliad, at least the Odyssey, and maybe even Gilgamesh. But in Montaigne, this psychological depth exists and becomes aware of itself as existing and becomes the subject of his inquiry in many cases. Montaigne is famous for his introspection and uh, for in, in particular for asking himself, what do I know? And for sustaining a tone of skepticism on some of the big questions. His writing seems to me to have been significantly influenced by the environment of the printing press. Like, I don't know, I don't know how anyone or that anyone would have been able to access all the materials Montaigne did, like even a hundred years before he accumulated a library of like a thousand books. And so this bookishness, which may in some ways lead to a weakening of vitality, produced its first flower in his writing. I'm sure you could nominate a few writers who preceded him in this way, but for my money, Montaigne represents the beginning of this two or three century burst of writing and thinking following the Renaissance that produced what is probably the best of human thinking in our super cycle of civilization. These were the guys who were all literate in Latin and Greek, who all read every word of Plato and Aristotle, who still knew their Thomas Aquinas and Plutarch and Tacitus, Gibbon. I mean, really, the, like, they were all classically educated, masters of capital R rhetoric, and all around brilliant guys. I was thinking the other day, you know, the members of the Royal Society in, in London or wherever that was in, in Britain. I've been thinking about this because, you know, most of them are like totally forgotten. Occasionally, if you're reading like the Wikipedia page of David Hume or something, it'll make mention of one of these guys. But if you go look up a list of the members of the British Royal Society from the 18th century and just read their biographies, it is crazy how much genius was happening, like all at once. I mean, and even like they've all been forgotten or most of them have been forgotten and any one of them could absolutely trounce any YouTube talker you can name. And that includes sticks, hex, and hammer. <laughs> anyway, mo okay, so most of uh, the essays that you're going to find here are about 5 to 15 pages long. His longest is something like 150 pages. Um, it's the famous Apology for Raymond Seabond, which as it's been 20 years since I read it, but if I remember right, it was, the it was a kind of defense of philosophical skepticism on behalf of a monk who was charged with heresy and threatened with torture or something or excommunication or whatever. But through all of this, Montaigne also manages to defend Christianity as well. So you don't have to have the impression of him that he's like some Sam Harris, you know, dogmatic atheist at all. He wasn't. Take a look in the next minute or so with me here at the list of titles for his essays. This is a complete list, I think. The two that I want to summarize for you in this episode are of books and of imagination or of the power of the imagination. I, I believe I've read all of these at some point. Um, I was really into Montaigne like when I was about 25, but I exchanged my old complete Montaigne for this streamlined collected essays a few years ago because the full two volume set was kind of falling apart and taking up space on the shelf. So, okay. Let's get to this essay on books. The essay actually begins with the same sort of proviso that 
to the reader gave at the outset of his essays. So I'm going to read the whole paragraph, which reiterates that point about how he himself is the subject of his writing. And it's also a nice example to let you hear his writing style without interrupting it. So give this a minute. Quote, I have no doubt that I often speak of things which are better treated by the masters of the craft and with more truth. This is simply a trial of my natural faculties and not of my acquired ones. If anyone catches me in ignorance, he will score no triumph over me, since I can hardly be answerable to another for my reasonings when I am not answers for them. When I. Oh, shoot, I messed that up. When I do not have answers for them myself and am never satisfied with them. Let the man who is in search of knowledge fish for it where it lies. There is nothing that I lay less claim to. These are my fancies, in which I make no attempt to convey information about things, only about myself. I may have some objective knowledge one day, perhaps have had it in the past when I happen to light on passages that explain things, but I have forgotten it all. For though I am a man of some reading, I am one who retains nothing. Isn't that great? Like, he's so humble, so self-deprecating. In fact, I want to say that, like, it's not even true that he's not a man of great knowledge. I think he's doing himself a disservice here. But many of his essays actually do convey knowledge in addition to revealing something about Montaigne. Another thing about this opening passage, something of a digression, it calls to mind a professor I had in grad school who insisted that, this is just a side piece that I thought I would mention, I've been thinking about lately. It, it calls to mind the, a, a professor I had who used to yell at us if we used the term which too much. So he wanted us to use that in its place. He, he, so for example, where Montaigne just said at the start of that section, quote, I often speak of things which are better treated by the masters of the craft. My professor wanted us to write, I often speak of things that are better treated by the masters of the craft. And I, I got to admit, I did internalize this. I took this on as my own aesthetic preference. But when I asked the professor why, he just said, well, using which all the time is archaic and pretentious. But with 20 years under my belt since then, I'm, and reading Montaigne again, I'm starting to wonder about this. Like, why is every innovation in language always good? and everything old or standard, bad and archaic, right? So let's consider this the declaration of the start of a trend toward proud and self-conscious linguistic archaism. Okay, uh, so anyway, this essay on books was published little more than 100 years after books in the modern, you know, post-printing press sense of the word, came into existence. And although <clears throat> that's maybe a part of the reason Montaigne is writing on this topic, his focus actually seems to be on what's in the books, which means this is not so much an essay on publishing or printing or the technology of the book, so much as it's an essay on the classics, frankly. And for Montaigne, the chief and distinguishing feature of the classics is that they challenge us to discover ourselves. Quote, in books, I only look for the pleasure of honest entertainment, or if I study, the only learning I look for is that which tells me how to know myself and teaches me how to die well and to live well. But right after that, he quotes Propertius, who says something in Latin, which the footnote translates as, quote, This is the goal toward which my horse should strain presumably self-knowledge, right? But this gives you a perfect example of what Montaigne does best, and kind of like most distinctively. Not just in the essay on books, but in all of his essays. He makes a clear, interesting point, and then supports it by quoting from some often very obscure source from classical literature. This example, for, you know, for example, quoting Propertius is perfect, because it shows something about how Montaigne's mind works. He wants to say, I look for entertainment or self-knowledge in books. But saying that calls to mind, for him, an obscure passage from per Propertius that isn't about books or self-knowledge, as far as I can tell. 
It's about horses straining towards a goal. Montaigne doesn't love to strain himself over books. He gives you permission to take it easy. There's no pride here at all. He says, quote, When I meet with difficulties in my reading, I do not bite my nails over them. After making one or two attempts, I give them up. What I do not see immediately, I see even less by persisting. Uh, he tells us that he reads Latin better than Greek, and for that reason, he prefers the Romans. So he praises Virgil and Lucretius and Catullus and Horace as first in rank, and suggests that almost all modern literature is a ripoff of Terence and Plautus. In the Roman literature, he values their ability to laugh, and he suggests that later writers have less wit. At one point, he compares the Aeneid to a 1516 epic poem by Ludovico Ariosto called Orlando Furioso, and it's the Aeneid that gets all the praise. To slam the modern epic, he gives us a quote from Virgil's Georgics, in Latin, of course, which says in translation, and sort of pointing at Ariosto, says, he, that is Ariosto, attempts only short flights. In this essay, he saves a couple of pages for a discussion comparing Plutarch to Seneca, praises them both, but I want to read the part where he distinguishes between them here. Montaigne says, quote, Plutarch is more uniform and consistent, Seneca the more uneven and various. He toils and strains every muscle and sinew to fortify virtues against weakness, fear, and evil appetites, which Plutarch seems to consider less dangerous, since he disdains to quicken his pace for them or to put himself on his guard against them. His opinions are platonic, moderate, and suitable to a civilized society. Seneca's are stoical and epicurean, and much more unusual, but, in my opinion, more suitable to the individual and more steadfast. Plutarch guides us while Seneca drives us on. This is just excellent, in my opinion. It's like, in my highest aspirations for this podcast, I imagine myself arriving at the kind of written clarity about books that he produces here. I mean, okay, yeah, maybe it's a little over simple. It's like, he, this is this and this is this, you know. But it's generally right and it's clear. And that general rightness is actually helpful to would-be readers of Plutarch or Seneca, I think. Montaigne writes some of historiography and history, but he isn't pleased with certain examples, his contemporaries. These are writers most of us haven't heard of now, I suppose, but they were obviously prestigious in his day. Uh, for example, when he criticizes the memoirs of Monsieur de Bellay, along with something by Guillaume, when he says, quote, there is no denying that in these two noblemen one can plainly see a great falling off from the frankness and freedom of writing that shine out from the older historians of their kind. I will not believe that they have falsified any general facts, but they have made it a general practice to twist the verdict on events, often against all reason, to our advantage, and to omit any awkward moments in the life of their master. And then of the same memoirs, he says, quote, Secret actions may be concealed, but to keep silent about what all the world knows and about things that have led to public consequences of such importance is an inexcusable defect. And I gotta say, this one feels relevant. Hold on, I gotta answer a text. So, okay. Anyway, that's about it for the On Books essay. Um, now, I also wanted to talk to you about his essay, On the Imagination. This is the one I like to teach most often. The essay is both funny and serious. Uh, the main gist of it is surprisingly kind of new age, I guess, in a sense. But then you realize this is actually one of the oldest perennial truths. The imagination creates the world. And in a sense, it is a sort of superpower if you know how to use it. So here we have a little Napoleon Hill posting, and it's good to revisit that idea every once in a while, right? To take a step back and ask yourself if you are imagining good things, beautiful things, healthy things, lucrative things, if, that's your, if you're into that, so that these 
manifest in your life, right? Like now we're sort of sounding like Oprah, but but it, it like while it can be abused, I think there is a fundamental truth in it. Montaigne talks first about how people can really send themselves spiraling by their imagination. So if you're imagining, you know, ugly things, it can go the other way too. Imagining future pain or imagining like Gallus Vibius, he says, what madness must be like until one finally goes mad. But then he gives such a clear and like visceral example that I can't resist dropping it in here. He says, quote, We start, tremble, turn pale, and blush as we are variously moved by imagination. And being abed, feel our bodies agitated with its power to the degree that as even sometimes to expiring, that is to say, like, I guess you could almost die of the imagination. And then he says, And boiling youth, when fast asleep, grows so warm with fancy, as in a dream to satisfy amorous desires. And then he quotes Lucretius, saying, So that as though it were an actual affair, they pour out mighty streams and stain the clothes they wear. And I think he's talking about like nocturnal emissions here. And you might be shaking your head and laughing and thinking I've embarrassed myself by reading it wrong or something, thinking like, no way such a well-known writer as Montaigne would mention something like that in 1517. But you're wrong. He certainly would. The guy loves talking about his bowels and his penis and so on. So now I want to sort of put my script down and just talk to you about what I used to say to students about this essay of The Power of the Imagination, and read some from his essay, and look at the Zoloft commercial and the I Renew bracelet commercial. Ready? Okay, so this essay becomes an essay about how the mind can influence and impact the body. And his favorite example is actually impotence or what we call ED now, right? And so there's some really funny examples. I'm going to give you my favorite. Actually, before I give you my favorite, I just wanted to note that at one point in this, he says, uh, he says, I, he says, I know by experience in the case of a particular friend of mine, one for whom I can be as responsible as for myself. And I think here he's almost confessing that this has happened to him at times but he says he overcame it by certain mental tricks. And so now he's going to tell you the story of a guy who had the same problem. Ready? Quote, A count of a very great family, and with whom I was very intimate, being married to a fair lady, who had formerly been courted by one who was at the wedding, all his friends were in very great fear. But especially an old lady, his kinswoman, who had the ordering of the solemnity, and in whose house it was kept, suspecting his rival would offer foul play by these sorceries, which she, the old lady, communicated to me. So, it's hard for you to understand that just hearing, but basically, he goes to a wedding, the count is getting married. In order for the wedding to be valid, you had to consummate the marriage, right? And so, for some reason, this woman invited some of her exes to the marriage, which, by the way, I mean, like, ladies, maybe don't do that at your wedding. But so the old lady, his, like, aunt or whatever, is nervous that he's not going to be able to perform. And she tells Montaigne, because Montaigne's this, like, you know, erudite, almost doctor kind of a guy. And what he's, okay, so then let me continue. She communicated that to me. I bade her reply upon me. I had, by chance about me a certain flat plate of gold, whereon were graven some celestial figures, supposed good against sunstroke or pains in the head, being applied to the suture, where that it might the better remain firm, it was sewed to a ribbon to be tied under the chin. Okay, so th that's crazy, right? But like, this was some superstition that people used to put a gold coin and tie it to the tops of their head with some ribbon, and that's supposed to prevent like sunburn, basically. He says, a foppery cousin germane to this of which I am speaking. That is, he's saying, this is nonsense, right? And then he says, Jacques Pelletier, who lived in my house, had presented this to me for a singular rarity. 
I had a fancy to make some use of this knack, and therefore privately told the Count that he might possibly run the same fortune other bridegrooms had sometimes done, especially someone being in the house who no doubt would be glad to do him such a courtesy. But let him go boldly to bed, for I would do him the office of a friend, and, if need were, would not spare a miracle it was in my power to do, provided he would engage to me upon his honor to keep it to himself, and only when they came to bring his caudal. It says, there's a note here that says, uh, a custom in France to bring the bridegroom a caudal in the middle of the night on his wedding night. So, He's supposed to, it says, if matters had not gone well with him, to give me such a sign. So I think Montaigne's downstairs, so he's supposed to like rap on the floor, saying like, it's happening, it's not working, right? Now, he had his ears so battered and his mind so possessed, or prepossessed by the eternal tattle of this business, that when he came to it, he really did find himself tied with the trouble of his imagination. And accordingly, at the time appointed, gave me the sign. So, you know... Whereupon I whispered him in the ear that here's what he should do. So here it is. Here's the prescription for impotence. Ready? He should rise under the pretense of putting us out of the room and after a jesting manner pull my nightgown from my shoulders. We were of much about the same height. Throw it over his own and there keep it till he had performed what I had appointed him to do, which was that when we were all gone out of the chamber, he should withdraw to make water to pee should three times repeat such and such words, he gave him a mantra, and as often do such and such actions. Okay, so he'll talk more about that in just a second. That at every of the three times he should tie the ribbon I put into his hand about his middle, his waist, and be sure to place the metal that was fastened to it the figures in such a posture exactly upon his reins, which being done and having the last of the three times so well girt and fast tied the ribbon that it could neither untie nor slip from its place, let him confidently return to his business, and withal not forget to spread my gown upon the bed, so that it might be sure to cover them both. So what does he do? The prescription is tie this thing that was, you know, the suture, the coin for the top of your head for sunstroke, tie it around your waist, make sure it's on your kidneys, say a bunch of little slogans or mantras or whatever, make sure you pee, jump up and down three times, etc. Okay, and then Montaigne says, these ape tricks are the main of the effect. Our fancy, our imagination, being so far seduced as to believe that such strange means must of necessity proceed from some abstruse science. Their very inanity, that means like their stupidity, gives them weight and reverence. And it works, okay? The guy is able to get it up and consummate the marriage with his wife. Now, he goes on and tells a number of other examples like this about Amasis, king of Egypt, who married Laodice and couldn't perform, and then he had to go pray at the temple of Venus and throw some coins in, and, you know, and then it worked. And this happens over and over again. And he gives advice to women on how to not talk down to their husbands who are struggling with this, and so on. But the main point for me here is that part where he says, the, um, the, these ape tricks are the main of the effect. Our imaginations being so far seduced as to believe that such strange means must, must of necessity proceed from some abstruse science. But they don't, right? This is bullcrap. He made up a little, it's like, it's like a, a free throw re routine in basketball. Like you do the same thing every time because it gets your imagination right. Now, when you really believe what Montaigne is saying here and you believe that it works, because it works, do you understand? It works. Then you start to wonder about like physicians and the potentially monkey tricks that they put us through, right? Things like, uh, well, we're going to need to like cup your testicles starting in eighth grade, like to check in, before you can play basketball, right? Like what? Now, I know, like I know that every normie out there will be like, oh no, you're wrong, Casey. That's to check for uh, like a hernia or something. But it's like, you know what? I think I'll know if I have a hernia. Like why do we have to do preventative hernia screening? Well, think about it. 
If you let someone cup your balls, like you're trusting them. And if you trust them, you have entered the medical, the, sorry, the medical mind. And now you trust your doctor, which means your doctor is going to be able to heal you better by giving you further monkey tricks, right? And the same goes potentially for, oh, we need to have you bend over so the physician can, you know, inspect you, right? Like in your orifices and stuff. Well, that's awfully invasive, but of course you're only going to do it for someone you seriously trust. And so part of what I suspect is that these kinds of supposedly necessary routine uh, inspections at the physical, these really are like, like it's, it's making you get to a point where you trust the physician so much that you would let them do that. And if you trust them that much, then you might also trust them when they give you what is essentially a sugar pill and tell you it will fix your depression. Do you understand? Like, you understand what I'm saying there, right? So I know that no one likes to agree with me on this. I, when I was in my 20s, I used to read this essay and talk to friends about it, and they were all on the antidepressants. Before I go on about this here, watch the Zoloft commercial now. You know when you feel the weight of sadness. You may feel exhausted, hopeless, and anxious. Whatever you do, you feel lonely and don't enjoy the things you once loved. Listen to the music. Things just don't feel like they used to. These are some symptoms of depression, a serious medical condition affecting over 20 million Americans. While the cause is unknown, Depression may be related to an imbalance of natural chemicals between nerve cells in the brain. Prescription Zoloft works to... And you see, right, from this video that, like, it's... There's that line in there. I'll even put it in again here. Depression may be related to an imbalance of natural chemicals between nerve cells in the brain. Right, where it says, like, though the cause is unknown... Well, it's like, what? What are you talking about? The cause is unknown. Oh, it may work something like this. It's like, yeah, that's not exactly scientific, is it? You have a nice little like cartoon drawing of serotonin happening here. Well, guess what? When you do the scientific studies, you can't do real-time testing of serotonin levels. It's it's always diagnosed based on self-reporting. So you go to a doctor and tell them you're depressed. They don't have a chemical test for that. They just ask you to fill out some paperwork. And then they go, oh, yeah, it says you're depressed. Well, like, yeah, you told him you were depressed, okay? And now he's going to give you a little pill. And you have been made to believe by this, you know, initiation into the medical cult that the doctor holds magical pills. But these pills are just mustard seeds, is what I'm saying. And look at this Newsweek article that was published in 2010. This article made the case that except for the most extreme cases of depression, these pills do nothing. They do nothing. But of course, this puts the doctors in a weird situation because people came to believe that the pills did do something. And so these people were like clutching their pills, like my pills make me feel not depressed. The doctor knows that's not true. What's making you feel not depressed is your faith in the pill, your belief in the pill, right? Now again, if you're one of these pill people, you don't want to believe this. You don't want to hear it because it, it breaks the whole thing apart. But that is what Montaigne is saying, and it is what a lot of the research seems to show. Plus, look at this, this silly commercial I used to show for an I Renew bracelet. Let's face it. We all have times when we feel weak and run down. I'm a student right now, so I'm pretty stressed out of my mind. Okay, I need a break. Can I just sit down for a second? So what if I told you that regaining your strength and feeling renewed was as easy as wearing this? That is so cool. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> this is great. What is it? What? And understand that like these things sell. People buy this kind of stuff. It is obvious bullcrap and it also works. That's the point. Is that like the mechanism of the action is not in the thing itself, but in the faith that people pin to the thing. But the thing is, once you believe in it, it actually does kind of work. There's a placebo effect, and people will go, oh, well, then it's fake, it's bullshit. But no, because if the thing activates the placebo effect, then, you know, now you're a better free throw shooter. Now you're a better golfer. Now you can get an erection, you know, and so on. So this is an amazing thing. Once you realize that like the, the essence of medical 
intervention is really placebo effect. And if we could harness placebo, if you can figure out a way to activate the placebo in someone else's mind, then, I mean, the, you'll be a billionaire, right? But this is basically my take on what I think most of medicine is at this point. Most of it is sugar pills. Now, I'm not saying they don't put a chemical in there. They do. But I don't think these chemicals work the way that people think they do. And oftentimes, placebo is more of a power than most people think. So especially with things like depression and anxiety and even probably certain amounts of like schizotypal or, or you know, neuroticism or whatever that supposedly can be cured by these pills. No, I think most of it is probably placebo effect. But of course, you know, whatever. If it works, it works. And of course, this is where the gurus who can lower their heart rate to like six beats a minute are also relevant, right? And you can think of other examples of this kind of thing. Curing depression, yes. Curing impotence, yes. Curing vertigo or insomnia, yes. And perhaps even skin diseases, you might throw that one at me. Yeah, though, I think yes. It's part of the reason I'm doing what, you know, a seven-day fast here. It's because I don't believe there's medicine that, I mean, I've looked at all the medicines, none of them work for what I've got. So I'm going to try something else like fasting and prayer, because I believe that that has helped people before. But maybe it's my belief as much as the fasting itself that's going to help me. All of this is promised by Montaigne's perspective on the imagination. And none of this is very different, by the way, from what Jesus told us. If you have, you know, faith the size of a mustard seed you can move mountains. And of course, a Zoloft pill is like exactly the same size as a mustard seed. Okay, I think that's it on Montaigne. Um, I've got a lot of editing to do for this one, but thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. Consider joining my Patreon. We've got a secret stream tonight at nine. Um, and, uh, oh, mm, yeah, and then back to Plutarch. I'm gonna follow Montaigne's lead and do at least one more on the Greek lives. And then the Heidegger essay, um, on the letter on humanism. And then after that, I'm not sure right now. But okay, have a great day. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.